Church app. All right, well, before we get into the message, let's go ahead and bow our heads for a word of prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you so much this morning that you've given us the means, the health, the ability, Lord God, to come here on this Lord's Day, Lord God, to sing your praises, to magnify Christ. Father, we pray as we have had this sweet time of fellowship over worship, that you would be with us now as we open up your word. Pray, Lord God, that the scriptures would be preached powerfully and that your spirit would use your word, Lord God, to bear fruit in our lives, that we might live out our faith in obedience and in faithfulness, Lord God, to you. So be honored in this time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, this week we are continuing our Philippians series, so if you would go ahead and turn in your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 1, and this morning's passage comes to us from verses 12 to 18, again, Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 18, and as is our custom here at BMC, let's go ahead and rise in reverence for the reading of God's word. I'll be reading out of the ESV. I want you to know, brothers that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. You may be seated. What is one place in the world that you have always wanted to visit? Obviously, with it being summertime right now, lots of people are traveling and going on vacation. Overall, 2023 has been a big year for tourism. There's all this pent-up demand for travel, especially now that most countries have lifted their COVID restrictions. Across the board, The demand for flights and hotels, rental cars, and vacation homes has never been higher. The most popular travel destinations in the world include places like Paris and Tokyo, Hawaii, and London. But one place that's at the top of virtually every list, no matter which list you happen to be looking at, is the city of Rome, the capital of Italy. Well, believe it or not, Rome was also at the top of the Apostle Paul's list of places he most wanted to visit. And that's saying something because Paul was quite the experienced traveler. See, Paul's missionary journeys had taken him all over the Mediterranean. If they used passports back then, his would have been filled with stamps from places all across Europe and the ancient Near East, from Jerusalem to Cyprus, all the way up to Athens. Paul even had hopes of traveling to Asia, but as we talked about last Sunday, the Holy Spirit redirected him by sending him to Philippi instead, which is how he first got acquainted with the people he's writing to in this letter. But despite how many places Paul had already been to, as many cities as he had seen, cultures he had experienced, and people he had met, Rome remained at the very top of his list. And the reason why had nothing to do with the city's gardens or villas, marketplaces, or theaters. Instead, it had everything to do with the gospel. This morning, we are continuing our study through the book of Philippians. And don't worry if this is your first time here. We actually just started this series last Sunday. And the hope is to slowly make our way through this book, verse by verse, every week from now until the end of the year. 
And in our introductory study, we covered the first 11 verses of chapter 1. And there we talked specifically about the historical context behind this letter. As a quick review, Paul planted the church in Philippi during his second missionary journey. It began with a female business owner named Lydia and a formerly demon-possessed slave girl and a jailer who once worked at the local prison. But that kind of motley crew of believers eventually grew to become a church, a congregation made up of saints, overseers, and deacons, which Paul was writing to now. We also talked about how the theme of this book is that of joy. Joy is the theme of Philippians. Again, the words joy and rejoice appear 16 times in this book. So even though Paul is going to talk about a variety of different subjects throughout this letter, joy is the glue that kind of holds this whole thing together. For example, in the opening section of Philippians, which we looked at last Sunday, Paul rejoiced. He expresses joy over this church because they held a special place in his heart. In verse 6, he said that he yearned for them all with the affection of Christ Jesus which is why his remembrance of them filled his prayers with joy. Well, in our passage this morning, Paul will continue to express joy, to express joyful gratitude. But this time, he will rejoice over the gospel itself. And more specifically, how that gospel was beginning to spread throughout the Gentile world. If you guys are taking notes, I'll be using three headings to organize our time together. And the first is this, the cost of gospel advancement. Starting again in verse 12, Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So I think it's appropriate for us to begin by asking this very obvious question, what exactly happened to Paul? Well, if you kind of glance down at the rest of this passage, you will see the term imprisonment appearing a few different times. Literally, that word means chains. Chains. During the first century, ancient prisoners would be fastened to these long chains, about 18 inches in length. And at each end of those chains were a set of handcuffs, one for the prisoner and the other for whoever or whatever that prisoner was attached to. It could be a part of a cell or an actual human guard. But regardless, the point was to keep that individual locked up and detained. Now, if being imprisoned is what happened to Paul, the next question would be, how? How did this happen? In other words, how did Paul end up becoming a prisoner in the first place? Well, as it turns out, a detailed report of all the events that led up to Paul's imprisonment can be found in Acts chapter 21, verses 28 uh, through 28. So if you look at chapters 21 through 28 of the book of Acts, you can see more or less a rundown of what led up to Paul's imprisonment. I'm just going to kind of quickly summarize it for you. Now, as you guys may or may not know, the Apostle Paul went on a total of three missionary journeys. That's really what the book of Acts is about. After his third missionary journey, he made plans to travel to the city of Jerusalem. And along the way, there were all these people who were warning him not to go. Don't go to Jerusalem, Paul. We know that's where you're headed. That's where your itinerary is saying that your destination is. But do not go to Jerusalem. And the reason why they were warning him not to go was because they knew that Paul had enemies in Jerusalem who opposed his evangelistic ministry. And those enemies were going to do everything in their power to try and kill Paul. But despite all of these warnings, despite all of these pleas, Paul was determined to go. Long story short, once he arrives in Jerusalem, Paul is overtaken by an angry mob of Jews. And he is subsequently arrested, and he's taken to Caesarea, which is just a few miles away, where he's kept in Roman custody for two years. Eventually, Paul is kind of tired of sitting around, and so he makes an appeal to Caesar. And he had the right to do this because Paul was a Roman citizen. And as a Roman citizen, everyone had a right to stand trial in Rome. So the authorities in Caesarea, what they do is they put Paul on a sailboat, and they basically ship him off to the capital. En route, there's this huge storm. 
that causes Paul's uh, ship to uh, basically be wrecked on shore of this island called Malta. And eventually, Paul is able to board another boat. And finally, he arrives in Rome sometime between AD 60 and AD 61. And once he's there, he's put in chains. And he's placed under guard until it's time for him to stand trial. And it was during that imprisonment, you see, that Paul wrote this letter, the book of Philippians. See, the Philippian church, they were grieved over Paul's situation. We know based on what we read last week that Paul dearly loved this church, but the reality was this church really loved Paul as well. So when they heard this news that Paul had been incarcerated, they wanted to help him. But the reality was there wasn't a whole lot they could do. Over 500 miles separated Philippi from Rome. And so Paul, he wrote this letter to reassure them that everything was going to be okay. In fact, for Paul, things were more than okay because he was finally in Rome. As I mentioned before, Paul had always hoped to make it to Rome. Ever since he first became a Christian, there was nothing more that he wanted than to travel to Rome. Well, as we see here, God finally answered his prayers, albeit not in the way that he or the Philippians had probably expected. Now, the question we might be asking ourselves is, why Rome? Besides the obvious, right? It's a nice place to visit. But what was so special about this city that Paul wanted to go there so badly? Well, during the first century, Rome was the most important place in the most important kingdom in the entire known world at this time. Not only was it the capital city, but it was also the empire's cultural and religious and economic hub as well. And as such, Rome was a really strategic uh, place to do ministry. I'm sure all of you guys have heard the expression before, all roads lead to Rome. Well, that saying is just one way of highlighting how important and significant Rome was at this time. You see, among the many things that the Romans were famous for, one particular thing they were known for was their well-developed civil infrastructure. Because the Roman Empire was so big, the Romans decided to build an extensive network of paved roads that helped to keep all the various parts of their vast empire together. These roads were designed to connect all the different provinces, and they became critical to the trade and commerce and communication that was taking place throughout the empire. Well, if all roads led to Rome, it also meant that all roads would lead from Rome to other places as well. And Paul understood this. You see, he knew that if he was in Rome, he would have far more reach and far more influence and that the dissemination of the gospel would happen more easily and effectively than if he were anywhere else on earth. And that is why, you see, Paul had long set his sights on Rome. For example, take a look at these passages, Acts chapter 19. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Or Romans 1.15 as Paul is writing to the church in Rome, he says, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Not only that, but Paul also intended for Rome to become his new base of operations for another missionary journey, a fourth missionary journey, which we believe never took place, this time to Spain. This is something he describes more about in Romans 15. He says, I have longed for many years to come to you, speaking to the church in Rome, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. So the reality was, there was nowhere else Paul would rather be than in Rome, even if it came at the cost of his personal freedom. In fact, based on what Paul says here, his imprisonment actually served to advance the gospel. That word advanced there that you see in Philippians 1, it's a military term that was commonly used to describe a group of soldiers going before the rest of the army to blaze a trail into new territory. They would do so by clearing a path, removing brush, chopping down trees, carrying away stones and other obstacles that stood in the way, all for the purpose 
of helping the army progress forward. And in the same way, you see, Paul viewed his imprisonment as something that was enabling the gospel to progress forward. His chains were an impetus for gospel proclamation. His imprisonment, a catalyst that would only further propel the good news throughout the whole Roman world. I love the way that Paul puts it elsewhere in 2 Timothy 2, 8 and 9. He says there, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. The NASB renders it, the word of God is not imprisoned. Paul's saying, I'm under house arrest. I'm incarcerated. But what I can't do physically, the word of God will do. It will spread. It will advance because it is not bound. See, friends, difficult circumstances cannot stop the advancement of the gospel. Only our disobedience can. Okay, let me say it again. Difficult circumstances... Even imprisonment cannot stop the advance of the gospel. Only our disobedience can. At the end of the day, I think most of our excuses for not preaching the gospel boils down to one simple thing. And that is that we are not prepared to pay the cost of sharing the good news. We are not prepared to pay the cost of sharing the gospel. Because to preach the gospel, especially these days, in our context, you have to be ready to pay a cost. The cost of your comfort, the cost of your reputation, the cost of your relationships, and maybe even more. This week I was doing my quiet time in the book of Acts, and there's this passage that has always struck me whenever I've come across it. It's about how the earliest Christians, the first century church, reacted to the hostility and opposition that they faced. In Acts 5.41 it says this, Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. The book of Philippians is all about joy and rejoicing. And we see here that wasn't confined to the church in Philippi, for even the Christians that are described in the book of Acts rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. You see, for Christians, suffering dishonor for the sake of Christ is supposed to be our joy. And that is why the Apostle Paul was more than willing to give up his personal freedom. It's because he knew his imprisonment would only lead to the gospel's advancement. And advance it did, even despite the fact that Paul was in chain. Leading us to our second point for this morning, the fruit of gospel advancement. Starting again in verse 12. Paul says, I want you to know, brothers that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. So despite the fact that Paul was undergoing these very difficult circumstances, his imprisonment had actually served to create new opportunities for gospel ministry, starting first with the whole imperial guard. That term, whole imperial guard, refers to an elite military force comprised of 9,000 soldiers who were primarily charged with protecting the king. But the imperial guard also performed other duties as well, such as keeping watch over high-profile prisoners, like Paul. So I want you guys to picture this for a moment. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for two long years, Paul found himself chained to a member of the Imperial Guard. And because these soldiers worked six-hour rotating shifts, that meant at least four times a day, the person keeping watch over Paul would change. And you better believe that Paul made it his aim to preach the gospel to every single guard who came into his cell. Remember, Paul was a missionary. You can take a missionary out of the mission field, but you cannot take the mission out of the missionary. This is the same guy who wrote in Colossians 4, 5, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. You see, in Paul's mind, the best way that he could spend his time in prison was to preach the good news. 
As each guard walked in and started to fasten his wrist to the chain Paul had been shackled to, I imagine Paul saying to them, I bet you think that I'm here stuck with you, when the reality is you are here stuck with me. For the next six hours, you're going to hear me preach the good news concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Out of curiosity, I actually did the math. Again, according to scholars, Paul's Roman imprisonment lasted for two years. So two years, that's 760 days, multiplied by four soldiers a day, a day again, six-hour rotating shifts, okay? So four soldiers per day. That equals 2,920. 2,920, think about that. 2,920 souls. 2,000. 920 opportunities to preach the good news. Over time, word of Paul's situation likely spread beyond the walls that confined Paul as prisoner. In fact, I want you guys to take a look at something Paul mentions at the end of Philippians, as he wraps up this letter in Philippians chapter 4, verse 22. He says there, all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. So apparently Paul had even led some of the officials in Caesar's court to faith in Christ. This is probably what he means when he says that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. You talk about making the best out of a bad situation. Paul's imprisonment enabled him to share the good news with the highest tiers of Roman society. The imperial guard and members of Caesar's court, people he would have never met or had access to unless he had been put in chains. Even prior to coming to Rome, Paul's initial arrest put him in contact with highly influential individuals, kings and governors like Festus and Felix and King Agrippa. Moreover, Paul's chains also allowed him to conduct an extensive letter-writing ministry as well, something, again, that he would have never done unless he had been in prison. Like, knowing what we know of Paul today, I seriously doubt that the Apostle Paul would have sat still long enough to write all those letters, documents that to this day are being read by millions upon millions of people unless he had been physically shackled to a Roman guard. But you see, God sovereignly put him there because he knew what the purpose was. In fact, notice what Paul says at the end of verse 16. He says, I am put here for the defense of the gospel. That language can also be translated, I was appointed for this purpose. It was originally used to describe a soldier receiving a special assignment. That is how the Apostle Paul viewed his imprisonment, as a special assignment given to him by none other than Jesus himself. You see, Paul's imprisonment was not his idea. Yeah, he had long desired to go to Rome, but he had no plans of doing so shackled in chains. It was God who put him there. In other words, God was ultimately responsible for Paul's imprisonment. And as Paul found himself coming into contact with all these people that he would have never met, the imperial guard and other members of Caesar's house, he began to recognize God's wisdom and God's providence in having done so. Again, God had put Paul in prison in order that Paul might preach the good news. And in the same way, you see, friends, each of us have been put somewhere. The language that Paul is using of himself in verse 16 can be described of all of us. God has put you somewhere. Why? So that we too might preach the good news. So I ask you this morning, where has God put you? Where has God put you? Maybe it's not where you envisioned. Maybe it's not where you prefer. I'm sure Paul didn't prefer being in chains. But wherever you are, and whatever circumstances you happen to be facing, know that God has put you there to share the gospel. For those of you who are students, has the gospel become known throughout your whole school? so they know your education is for Christ. For those of you who are career professionals, has the gospel become known throughout your whole office so they know that your profession is for Christ? 
For those of you who are moms and dads, has the gospel become known throughout your whole family? So your kids know your parenting is for Christ. On and on, I can go. But for each and every one of us, God has put you in your situation, whatever it might be, so that you might bear witness for Christ. Is your commitment to the gospel so strong that you are stewarding every circumstance, whether it's good or whether it's bad, to the glory and praise of God? Because Paul was a man who was absolutely devoted to preaching the gospel. He viewed obstacles as opportunities. He saw a prison as a pulpit. He saw the guards who were assigned to keep watch over him as a captive audience. And in the same way, no matter what our chains, so to speak, look like this morning, no matter what situation or circumstance we find ourselves in, no matter the setbacks or difficulties we are currently experiencing, all of those things can be used to advance the gospel. All of them. And when we're obedient to this command, God will grow in us a deeper joy. He will cultivate in us the joy that Paul is talking about here in Philippians. And that leads us to our third and final point, the joy of gospel advancement. The joy of gospel advancement. Not only did Paul's witness affect all the non-Christians he came into contact with, it also served to encourage and strengthen fellow believers in the Lord as well. Take a look at verse 14. He says there, And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So as news began to spread about Paul's imprisonment, other Christians throughout the empire also became emboldened to preach the gospel. In other words, Paul's example had proven to be inspirational because courage is contagious. I remember as a college student, my uh, campus fellowship would hold these weekly random EV times, random evangelism times. Basically, we would go on campus and we would share the gospel with random students who were sitting around. This was before the day of cell phones, so like people would actually just sit there and just be staring off into space. All right, So we would take advantage of that, and we would go and share the gospel with them. Of course, talking to strangers is intimidating, right? Sharing the gospel with strangers is even more intimidating. And so I remember the first time I attended one of these random EV sessions, I was like freaking out. College freshman, I'm thinking to myself, how are these people going to react? What are they going to say? What if they start yelling at me? What am I supposed to do? Well, the organizers of these random EV times, they were really smart because rather than sending us out alone, they would pair us up two by two. In other words, they would have us go out with a partner. Usually it was an upperclassman so we could watch and observe how they did it. And that was so, so good for me because I would watch these wiser, more experienced upperclassmen confidently sharing their faith. And by confident, I don't mean arrogantly, okay? They were talking to these unbelievers with respect, with decorum, with tactfulness. But there was this peace and there was this calm about them that I think was born out of conviction and prayer. And that really served to bolster my own faith. And before I knew it, I was the one who was leading other students for random EV times. Not only as a collegian myself, but for many years as a pastor to collegians. Because once again, courage is contagious. As other believers throughout the Roman Empire heard about Paul's faithful witness in prison, rather than becoming timid or discouraged, as we might expect, they were encouraged to exercise greater boldness in their witness for the Lord. Because that is the effect courage has. There's a saying that's often repeated in missionary circles. It's the phrase, the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. The blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. Of the church. It basically describes how historically every attempt to suppress Christianity has paradoxically re resulted in Christianity's growth. Whether it's governments or states or just people, every attempt to suppress Christianity has paradoxically resulted in Christianity's expansion and growth. A great example of this is the ministry of Jim Elliott. For those of you who don't know who Jim Elliott is, he was an American missionary who in 1956 
decided to preach the gospel to the Alca Indians of Ecuador. Unfortunately, Elliot, along with the four missionaries he was with, ended up being killed by the very people he sought to preach to. But thankfully, that wasn't the end of the story. Because the courageous example of these men, you see, it sparked a worldwide resurgence in global missions. In fact, it's been said that an entire generation of new missionaries rose up after hearing about the death of these men, including Jim Elliott's wife, Elizabeth Elliott. Believe it or not, Elizabeth Elliott even went back to the very tribe of people who killed her husband, and after many years of faithfully serving them and befriending them, she eventually helped to bring them to faith in Christ. And in the same way, you see, Paul's example here served to inspire other believers throughout the empire to be equally bold and faithful in their proclamation of the gospel, because courage is contagious. But as it turns out, not everyone had the best of intentions. Everyone's finding Paul to be an inspiration. They're like, man, I want to do what Paul is doing. So they're going out, they're preaching the good news, but not all of them have great intentions. Because take a look at verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So in addition to all these people who were preaching the gospel to encourage Paul and to augment what he was doing, some were actually preaching the gospel to undermine him. Now, who exactly were these rivals? Who were these haters? Who were these opponents of Paul? We can't really be sure because Paul doesn't specify here. Whoever they were, Apparently, their issue with Paul was not doctrinal in nature because Paul doesn't rebuke them for heresy or blasphemy. Instead, their problem was personal, meaning they were looking to add salt to the wounds of Paul's imprisonment. They knew Paul was in chains, and so they sought to kick him while he was down by distressing him, by preaching the gospel with these impure motives. Based on what Paul says here, I think it's safe to assume these rivals, whoever they were, were the self-promoting type, meaning they were the type of people who were trying to acquire more followers, more attention, perhaps even more wealth for themselves. But regardless of their motives, notice again the surprising statement that Paul makes, that he's able to rejoice. Why? Because Christ was being preached. Okay, we talked about how Christian joy is something very different from the way that the world typically defines happiness. Because in the world, your circumstances dictate happiness. But for believers and followers of Jesus Christ, joy is transcendent. It is independent of circumstances. Paul says, yes, there are some who preach Christ out of envy and rivalry and selfish ambition and conceit. But I rejoice because the gospel is being proclaimed. Look at verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. Imagine being an individual who is so passionate and so committed to the preaching of the gospel that even your own reputation is secondary. We live in a world, and this is something that affects us even inside the church, we live in a world where we are so careful to curate our reputation before other people because we want people to respect us, we want people to like us. We want to amass followers for ourselves, whether it's on social media or elsewhere. But imagine that your commitment to the gospel is so strong that your individual reputation does not matter by comparison. At the end of the day, again, Paul was so committed to the advance of the gospel, it did not matter to him if some people were preaching Christ out of rivalry or selfish ambition. Rather, the most important thing for Paul was that Jesus was being talked about. I think this can even be applied in some sense to the church at large because I think as many of us are aware, the Christian church has become divided and fractured into all these different little camps and tribes. So you have conservative Bible church tribe, that's us. 
And then you have the woke tribe, and the reformed tribe, and the charismatic tribe, and the seeker-sensitive tribe, and you can just go on and on and on and on. And while our differences are important, I'm not saying they're not, those differences are important. We should not gloss over them as if they don't matter. At the same time, we have to admit that we are often less charitable than we ought to be with other genuine believers with whom we disagree. But whenever Christ is proclaimed, and wherever the true gospel is being preached, we should seek to extend as much grace and charity as we reasonably can, so we can say, alongside Paul here in Philippians, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. God is doing something. God is doing something in other churches that are not like ours, and God is doing something here at our church too. The gospel is the most important message we have. The gospel is a message that this world desperately needs to hear. That's why this church was planted. It's a story of how a holy God has sought to make atonement for sinful man by coming down in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who knew no sin, took on our sin at the cross, and there he became our substitute as he stood in our place, receiving the judgment that was due our sin. And three days later, the gospel says Jesus rose from the grave, signifying to all people that he had conquered over sin and Satan forever. And for all who would repent of their sins and place their faith in Christ, God freely offers us today the gift of salvation that Christ has won for us through his life, death, and resurrection. That is the gospel. Again, I, I firmly do believe that God has been doing something kind of remarkable, kind of cool here at BMC these days. As many of you guys are aware, we've had a lot of unbelievers and seekers coming out to our church recently. Between the basics class and uh, a new outreach ministry that some of our members are helping to launch, and uh, the, the Mission Sunday that uh, I, I talked about in the announcements that's going to be held next month, and an evangelism equipping seminar that we have scheduled for later this fall, God is giving this church so many opportunities to preach the gospel. So as we close, I pray that in the coming weeks and months, as we continue to make our way through this book, you and I would be reminded again and again and again, because we need all those reminders, that Christian joy is one that transcends our circumstances because it is a joy that is fixed on the good news of Jesus Christ. So my encouragement to you this morning is rejoice. In fact, rejoice specifically by preaching the gospel with boldness and with clarity and with conviction, all to the glory and the praise of God. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for the good news. We know, Lord, that it is a truth that we become all too familiar with, and therefore we oftentimes take it for granted. But we thank you, Lord, that through your word you remind us and you wake us up, Lord God, to the reality of a lost and dying world that is in desperate need of hearing about Jesus. Lord, each of us have circumstances in our life that you know we don't love, things that we prefer we would be removed from. But we know, Lord God, that you have placed us where we are for a specific reason. And so we pray, Lord God, that you would help us to steward our circumstances well so that we would express joy, Lord God, over our salvation, first by preaching the good news of our salvation, Lord God, to those around us. Would you embolden and empower your church, strengthen our faith, help us to overcome our fear, and deepen within us a joy and conviction to make Jesus known, for he deserves all the glory. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.